You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Avid Reader brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Today, we're happy to have with us Laura Vapnyar. Uh, Laura is the author of two collections of short stories. One, There Are Jews in My House, and Broccoli and Other Tales of Food and Love. And also, she's got lots of um, stories in The New Yorker, which are great. And if you have the archive online of The New Yorker, because Laura's last name is so unusual, you can just go to the archive and pick up all four or five of her stories there. Um, Laura's first novel was Memoirs of a Muse back in 2006, and her newest, The Scent of Pine, that we'll be talking about today, was just released at the beginning of this year. Thanks, Laura, for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Um, so you're lucky you got two articles in the New York Times, one at the end of the year and then the other one just in the Sunday book review. Um, yes, I was extremely lucky. And the first one came um, as a New Year's gift. And New Year's is the most important holiday in Russia. It's like Christmas here. I'm lucky to even be able to get a subscription, <laughs> let alone an article. And, and uh, I also wanted to tell you that Tomorrow, I'm interviewing Gary uh, uh, Steingart about mm -hmm. Little Failure. So I have um, two Jewish-Russian emigres in a row. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I was re in reading all of your stuff. I, I think you should write a cookbook because you talk about salami and meatballs and cream cheese and lox and chocolate and a whole slew of vegetables. So, uh, and then your first photograph in America is you holding. A pineapple still wearing your Russian clothes. Maybe you should try a, uh, a cookbook. The problem is that I really, really love food and love writing about food and reading about food and eating food, <laughs> but I don't really cook, so it would be um, irresponsible of me to write a cookbook. <laughs> well, that's very nice of you to admit that. Um, and you were, you know, when you, when you had that picture taken of you holding the pineapple, you weren't very happy. You were unhappy at that point being in America, right? Yes, I was um, disappointed by most of the things except for that pineapple. Pineapple was <laughs> really good. So, well, before I continue to keep talking, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about The Scent of Pine and how it came about? So, the story behind uh, this novel, uh, some of my novels start with a short story. I would write uh, a short story and then it would grow into something larger and it will become a novel. But this one actually started as an assignment from a New Yorker. They sent me to Russia to write a nonfiction piece about sexual education in Russia. And I got too involved with that piece because I didn't really want to write about sexual education in Russia. And I was drawn to this particular story that really happened to me when I was working in a Soviet summer camp as a counselor. And so I started to write about that. And since I'm absolutely incapable of writing nonfiction, because I, I, I have to lie, I have to invent things. So it turned into fiction, and later it turned into novel. And um, I structured it. So um, there is a contemporary romance, two contemporary American characters, uh, one with Russian background, one is uh, simply American. And the Russian woman tells her lover the story that happened to her 20 years before in a Soviet summer camp. So, uh, and that's how this novel came about. So funny because <clears throat> even though it's somewhat autobiographical for you, it is for me too because both of my grandparents came from Vitebsk in Belarus. Oh. And um, I also went to a Jewish summer camp where we were told to keep our hands above the covers. So when I was reading it, I was thinking, wait a minute, this happened to me too. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I know. And it's funny because from the town that my grandfather came from to, to avoid the pogroms and left his entire family behind was where, where Marc Chagall, the artist, was lived also when they were contemporaries. So that painting of his, My Village, is the painting of my grandfather's town. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. I, I know. It's a... Uh, it's a, and I always have that picture above my desk, and I turn around and I can see the village. And because there's nothing left because of World War One and World War Two, the synagogue and everything was destroyed, and as was the cemetery. But um, I wanted to ask you about 
you know, Lena um, talks at one point in the book about the inevitability of happiness, and then later, sadly, she talks mm-hmm. about the inevitability of unhappiness. Do you think there's a do you think there's a middle ground that you can explore because it's two sides of one coin, or do you think it's just kind of like the th- it's as thin as the edge of that coin? Because both of them are absolutes, and I wonder what you think the middle is. Well, I think um, when she talks about inevitability of happiness, that's uh, uh, idealism of youth. You're 18, you're about to enter your love life, and of course you have great expectations and high hopes, and um, it just... Uh, you feel so um, emotional and uh, so full of energy and strength just because you're young that you think that happiness is inevitable. Then, uh, 20 years later, you become older, you had all these unhappy experiences, and if you're a rational person, um, you start thinking, oh, so this um, love affair didn't work out, and this love affair made me really unhappy, and this love affair was even worse, so <laughs> why would I expect happiness? So, and uh, the person comes to the idea of impossibility of happiness. And the middle ground, I think, would be actual happiness, because we do have it occasionally. Do you think that Lena would, at the end of the book, do you think, well, before I ask that, when Lena sees Inca, and Inca's successful, and she's dressed really nicely, and she has this great job. Um, do you think that Lena's kind of jealous and and, and kind of is um, wishes Inca was not doing as well as she was, given their past history? Um, yes, it, it, exactly. And um, I I know that a lot of people feel that about their successful friends. I, I actually think that all people feel that about their successful friends. It's just um, that makes me feel better. It's a question of whether you admit it to yourself that you're a little jealous of your friend's success or not. Because here, um, jealousy comes from because um, Lena and Inca they are almost like siblings, so they um, had the same conditions growing up. So if one became successful and the other didn't, it's not because um, one had more privilege or more special circumstance in love, and just she was better. So that causes extreme jealousy. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's very telling that you say that. That people don't generally admit it. There's a feeling they have when somebody um, does a better piece of art or gets an article in the New York Times, uh, and and they don't. Um, and I don't think there's anything evil or immoral about that feeling. I think it's kind of a natural one, but. I don't think most people would agree with us, honestly. Um, I I hope that if people just look uh, deep into themselves, they would agree with that. Yeah, I think they would, but I don't think many people do that actually. Hey, so so if um, if you were <laughs> if I feel I felt so sad when no one shows up at Lena's talk, I, it really made me sad. Um, if you were there, would you have shown up at it? I never imagined myself as audience for that talk. Uh, I imagined myself as a presenter, and I've had this experience many times when I would give a reading and nobody would show up. Actually, not many times, but a few times. Uh, Would I want to go to that talk? Yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, I would just go to be jealous of the person um, giving the talk. (laughs) Well, too bad you weren't there. It would have been better off for her. Well, the the alternative that happens to her because her talk is canceled is that she meets Ben. Um, it was very interesting the way you portrayed the initial scene when by the swimming pool because I think a lot of people um, who later end up having relationships have an instant at the beginning when um, they pretend like they're not aware of each other. Why do you think mm-hmm. why do you think people do that? Out of fear, out of anxiety, out of inadequacy? There's got to be a reason. Um, well, I think that if there is sexual tension, it's called tension for a reason. It's, uh, it makes you tense. It makes, makes you scared. So you, you, you retreat. You, you feel uncomfortable. And especially um, swimming pool is 
quite an unusual place to, to meet somebody. I mean, not the swimming pool itself, but um, water, being in the water, and meeting a stranger in the water and falling in love. And that's pretty strange, so that would make um, people doubly tense. I, I like the way she switches from one lane to the other. That, that's what I would have done, too. It's funny, too, how if they hadn't acted upon... It's funny how your life pivots on points throughout your life. I remember I was in an airport once, and I walked past this woman, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and we kept walking. And then, like, 100 feet later, she turned around at the same time I turned around, and we looked at each other, and we both knew... Again, it's like your sexual tension. We both knew... But then we kept walking. And I always thought, what if, you know, what if I had turned around and walked towards her? And Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, that's why it's so much fun to be a fiction writer. Because you can, yeah. You don't wonder what if. You, you kind of create what if. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the reasons I, you know, I would love to, you know, I, one of the reasons I can't write is because I'm afraid to lie. And one of the things you just said a few minutes ago is that, Lying is yeah. fine. That's why. I can't help it. It's not <laughs> fine, but I can't help it. <laughs> well, that's why you're so good. <laughs> um, so what are your wishes towards Lena at the end? Because you gave a lot of work to the reader. Um, the reader is, at least this reader, is ambivalent towards her and certainly ambivalent towards Ben. In fact, um, I'm not giving anything away because it was in the New York Times or wherever that they said, you know, Ben is smug and he's kind of a liar. I don't know if I feel that way about him. Do you? No, not at all. I was, um, frankly, I was stunned that uh, uh, he was called a liar. I mean, I love that review. That was such a glowing praise, and I'm in love with um, <laughs> praise. But, uh, and I'm very grateful for the reviewer. But yes, I was kind of surprised that. Uh, because I, I, he, he is weak. He's not a strong-willed man, but um, many people are like that. Yeah, but... His lying is caused by the fact that he's, um, well, he's not strong enough, and he's afraid to hurt um, people around him. So that, that's what causes his behavior, which can be seen as dishonesty. Yeah, I was going to say weakness as well. And there, there are plenty of awkward moments between the two of them. And the interesting thing is you did not make him, you know, physically attractive or very physically attractive. And I do have a mental image in my mind of him, but it's funny because I don't really have a mental image in my mind of Lena. And if this movie was, if this book was cast as a movie, do you have any idea who might play her? Some, some type of person? Um... I, I discussed this problem with my students in my uh, creative writing class. Uh, it, when you're writing a love story, it's uh, better to have your main character kind of faceless so the reader can identify with the main character. And it's better to um, describe love interest as, uh, as well as possible so the reader can kind of fall in love with love interest along with the character. Yeah, and it also gives you... But an uh, I never thought of that who would play Lena. Um, I, I, I can't think of a name right now, but I wanted to be somebody not, not striking, not extremely attractive, and yet uh, a kind of person that would grow on you as you watch the movie. It could almost be like... If she was made up properly, it could almost be like Uma Thurman, except she's too tall. Cause... Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, if she made uh, much less beautiful than yes. yes, probably. Yes, but she doesn't have classically beautiful features, but she does look a little bit Russian now. Um, oh, yes, 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 something like that. Um, what's the cheekbones? You, you have them too. I have them. Um, uh, uh, so... We, t we were talking about the moment that the two of them met, um, Ben and and, uh, and Lena. But what about um, Inca at summer camp and the situations they find themselves in with regard to their own relationship? How come you think that that relationship stopped and didn't go further than it did at certain times? If you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You know what, uh, if I were inventing this relationship, 
I would know the answer because I would be in complete control then. But I actually took this relationship from real life. I did have a friend like Inca, and she was even named Inca. And um, when I left for the United States, our relationship just stopped. And uh, I, I regret it, but um, I, I don't really understand why, but somehow I, I couldn't keep in touch just because I was so far away and uh, she couldn't keep in touch. We are not, we were not um, long distance type of friends. We, we needed to be close, we needed to laugh together, to talk together, to, to be physically close. But uh, since it wasn't possible, somehow it didn't. Did you, did you like Lena, come across her again 20 years later? Have, have you rediscovered her using Facebook or Google or anything like that? I tried. I tried, but uh, that part is an invention. I, I tried to look her up, and um, I couldn't. Huh. I don't know anything about her. How, you know, having, you know, the one thing, one of the things I find it difficult to comprehend simply because I probably wouldn't be able to do it, if you came here, I guess, in 1994, and I know the story about how, how your husband was able to find a job quickly, but you couldn't, so you decided to turn to writing. But how were you able to, how were you able to learn the English language in such um, uh, an intimate way that you're able to write the way you are? What is it that allowed you to have the nuance and the idiomatic expressions that you do? Well, it certainly didn't come from speaking to people because even now I rarely speak English. It just so happens. I uh, speak English to my students, and to my editor, to my agent, agent, and that's about it. Oh, and I speak English during interviews. <laughs> uh, so it's mostly for reading. I read a lot, and I watch a lot of movies, uh, so I hear spoken English in movies. And uh, I watch a lot of TV so from there too, and I really read a lot and very diverse books. Well, so, so you generally, when you're speaking during the day, you're speaking in Russian. Yes, only in Russian. Even with my kids, my kids are 16 and 19, and I always speak Russian to them. And since it's easier for them to speak English, they answer in English. That's interesting. Do you? I suppose you think in Russian and. And you dream in Russian. If I think about my children or about my family life, I uh, I, I think in Russian. But if I uh, think about my plot, my characters, my, my work, I only think in English. That's so There's strange. There's a very big division. It's like you're schizophrenic. <laughs> oh. That's, yeah, that's kind of. <laughs> Sorry, but. The language, language is schizophrenia. Oh. So, like, if you're a man, even the title then, The Scent of Pine, I mean, it's very evocative. Um, and I, would, I wasn't very happy with the title. I was always afraid that it would remind people of air freshener or something like that. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> but it kind of does. But the cover is really I mean, good. I, I tried to look up my book on Amazon, and the first thing that popped up was air freshener. <laughs> I didn't. I really didn't want to say that, but it is kind of true. I thought of pine saw that cleaner, but um, well. So, what did you use it for then, if you didn't like it? Um, I couldn't come up with a better one. Oh, I came up with a better one, but nobody uh, agreed with me that it was better. The initial title was Anatomy of a Hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then people would think it was you know an animal book, and I'd have to put it in the pet section of my bookstore. Yes, kind of like that, or something about animal cruelty. Because anatomy of the hedgehog, you probably need to slice the hedgehog to see what's inside, or something like that. So nobody wanted that. Well, it might be painful. It might be painful to do that as well. How come you have? How come you talk about hedgehogs so much in the book? Because you do in different contexts as well. Yeah, Ben Ben talks about hedgehogs and they have that wonderful conversation that has two layers of meaning. But then earlier in the book when she's in Russia there's hedgehogs too. How come? Uh I, I think what um I meant to do with hedgehogs is that 
uh, when people fall in love, they would focus on a certain detail that uh, just if they weren't in love wouldn't have any meaning whatsoever. But since they're in love, they would see it as something meaningful, as an omen of their love life or something like that. So when Hedgehog appears in the story and uh, Lena associates the Hedgehog with her meeting her first boyfriend, her first, first love, and then uh, Ben starts talking about Hedgehogs and she doesn't see it as a mere coincidence that she thinks, I'm like, oh, Hedgehog, that means it's love again, or something like that. It's, yeah, it's like when a couple go out on a first date and, and the guy says, I like oranges. And she goes, you like oranges? Yeah. I like oranges too. Wow. You know. Yes, 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 yes exactly. So, but uh, here, hedgehogs are more unique and more rare. Yeah, they are. Well, that goes to like, you know, when you do have that initial moment of love and for the first infatuatory period of it, you know, everything works perfectly. But in your story, um, with regard to Lena and her husband, you know, it started out, you know, in a certain way, and then it gets to the point, I guess, like where lots of husbands and wives are. The things that were endearing at first, the little mannerisms and the sayings, become an irritant later on. And you describe that very well because you don't overdo it, but do you find that to be true? I mean, I've, it's been true in my life. I, do you find that to be something that happens in your experience with all couples? Well, I don't know that many uh, couples intimately, uh, basically know only uh, couples where I was uh, part of the couple. And <laughs> for me, yes, each time it was true. Yeah, I know. That's a shame, isn't it? Yes, kind of. But also it's uh, it's part of the whole deal and uh, you can't kind of escape it. You know, it's funny that, you know, in reading your stories, um, especially the one in the New Yorker that involves the girls, the girls with the dollhouses and the and mm -hmm. the, the soldier with the the father with the crippled leg. And then in real life, it repeats. It's it's you have this theme um, that's obvious um, because of your life of people who may be Jewish, live in Russia, may be about to go to the United States. And you've utilized it. Um, in a wonderful way, just like Vlad Vladimir Nabokov um, did in his works. So um, how long do you think there's ever going to be like a mystery or a science fiction book or a, a Southern Gothic or a comedy? Do you think you'll switch at some point to some other type of genre? Mm, I, I don't know. It's really hard to say. It's uh, it's kind of unpredictable where, uh, whether this will happen. Do you have anything? Are you doing anything? Are you writing short stories now? Are you writing another novel now? Uh, I'm writing another novel now, and it's uh, very different from the first two, but uh, it's not uh, like supernatural or, or uh, gothic or horror. <laughs> or well, it's, it's funny because interviewing Gary tomorrow about um, Little Failure. Do you know, or do you, are you two, do you know each other? You know, we, we know each other, not intimately, but uh, yes. Because, you know, his work comes from this, it's kind of like Woody Allen, his work comes from this deep sense of anxiety and worry, but at the same time, it, all of it's imbued with humor. And, um, and, and you come at it from a different angle, but there's still this, especially in Lena, anxiety, worry about the future. Why hasn't this happened? Why hasn't this happened? Do you think a lot of that comes because you lived in a Russian, in a regime that was, in my mind, oppressive or totalitarian or like it was in the summer camp? Do you think it left a mark on you? It could be. It, it, it certainly uh, left a, a mark on me, but I think that particular brand of anxiety and humor that uh, Gary and I share, I, I think it comes from being Jewish, not from being Soviet. Well, I know it's it... just It's in our genes. It's <laughs> like anxious humor. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, that's how I, I live my life. It's like, I, you know, it's just, it's, and I don't know why it is. Um, you know, he talks about his mother and 
how he was called little failure or snotty or whatever. And, you know, I can remember times when my mother might say to me, oh, I wonder why you never did anything with your life. That, that, will, <laughs> that will certainly do it to you. But, um, well, do you think Jewish parents are generally, you know, the, the, uh, the idea in the United States is that Jewish parents um, push their kids, and that's why you end up with Jewish doctors and Jewish lawyers and comedians and things like that. Do you think there's an equal amount of, like, nurturing and caring, but also this kind of, you know, um, you know anxiety-provoking behavior on part of Jewish parents? Boy, that was a long question. It didn't really mean anything. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that it's, um, um, it's a really Jewish trait, because there was this book, um, I, I don't remember what this was called, about Chinese mother, tiger mom, something like that. And um, it yeah. turns out that Chinese parents are even worse than Jewish, they, and they push their kids even harder. But um, it, it's, a, it's a constant source of anxiety for me. I'm afraid that I am the worst type of Jewish parent. I am very pushy. I am very um, too involved with my children. Too, I, I am smothering, and also I'm very self-indulgent. So it's like I am the worst, and I, and I look at myself not as a daughter, not as a product of Jewish parenting, but as a Jewish parent myself, and I'm horrified. I think you wrote a little bit about it, but yeah, I guess you're overprotective too, right? Yes. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. And uh, and are you all? Well, wait a minute, are you overindulgent with them too? Like, if they want something, do you automatically get it for them, or do you make them earn it, or how do you do that? Um, I'm afraid I am. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So, what do they Whatever want? Whatever horrible trait a parent might have, I think I have it. <laughs> Look, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing if you're Jewish. You're obviously you're wrong. I'm sure you're a wonderful mother. You know, it's just that you're looking at it. I'll just I'll I'll just wait until my kids uh, write their memoirs and then we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. What do they want to be? Well, my daughter wants to be a writer, so yes, I'm scared of that. <laughs> Well, uh, that's pretty funny. Well, so, uh, I, what was I going to ask you? I guess it's like uh, what I was saying about Nabokov and you and Gary and other people who are writing with English as their second language. It seems like you, you come at it in a different way. And I was talking to my manager at my bookstore, and we were both saying how we like that kind of writing because... It's not something we experience when a person who's writing with English as their first language. Do you? It's, it's hard because you you can't step away from it. But do you find that that's the that's true with you as well? I mean, it's hard to say. I think the fact that English is my second language makes it more exciting for me. It's uh, it's more challenging and more exciting, and. Um, I I love Russian language. I, I think it's beautiful, but English language is like a wild romance. I'm just I'm um, attracted to it in a very powerful way. It's magical for me. It's funny because if you had moved to say Italy or France instead of America, you know the Romance languages, Italian and Spanish and um, mm -hmm. French, they're such beautiful, lilting musical languages but uh, English is kind of blocky and not as nasty as German but it doesn't have the same kind of musical quality but and it's a hodgepodge of, of different languages so it's how do you when you think of an idiom uh, or you think of a colloquialism do you first think of it in Russian and then figure out a way that you can convert it to something that works in English do you do it that way no, no, never. Um, it always comes to me in English. Uh, the only way, uh, the only time when I think of something in Russian is that um, when I remember a particular line, something that uh, somebody said in Russian or a Russian joke, then I remember <laughs> it in Russian and then I uh, have to translate it into English and usually it's very challenging. Hey, so in the when you were in summer camp, did 
did she really dance the lambada? Because you couldn't have made that up. No, no, that that of, of course that really happened. <laughs> it had to have because yeah, you couldn't have made it up. It was, <laughs> it was too strange. Now, see, that was really funny. I mean, that's the other thing is your book is definitely sprinkled with lots of wry humor, um, but at the same time, um, well, how would you can would you say your books are? I don't, and your stories are dramatic. Do you think there's a mixture of comedy? I don't think there's that much comedy in them, is there? Well, it's um, it's not comedy, but it's sad, un understated uh, kind of humor. Yeah, it's like we were but talking. It, 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 it's always there in life. And you you can go um, through the most tragic situations, and there would be something funny in it. Right, and I've experienced that even at funerals, I guess. It's kind of what they call gallows humor, I guess. So what books, um, what Russian authors do you like? See, I would, I, th I like Nikolai Gogol and, and obviously Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. Are there particular classicists that you like as well, that you've read in Russian? Um, I, I read in Russian all the time. My number one favorite is Chekhov. Uh-huh. And um, I love his short stories, but I also love his plays. I constantly re reread in his plays. And uh, there is another author who is also playwright and a short story writer, uh, Ludmila Petrushevska. She, she's still alive. And she, I, I think she's been recently translated into English. And uh, she, she's been a great, great influence and one of my favorite writers ever. Um, but I also reread Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, I think, almost every year. And every time I discover something new about uh, works that I know really well, but uh, when you read them again and again, it's like there is always some, something like a new chapter hiding between the pages. I know, I just reread The Idiot, and that's exactly how I felt. And it's funny, too, I, one of, two of my favorites are n not necessarily Russian, Nikolai Gogol and Kafka, and um, uh, I just reread The Metamorphosis, and mm -hmm. that's that's one of my favorite, and then the best opening line in in literature, in my opinion. But oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is as Gregor Samsa woke from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a giant cockroach. Except it's magnificent, yes. Yeah, but N Nabokov said that it wasn't a cockroach, which really bothers me because I want it to be a cockroach. And he says it was vermin or insect, but I want it to be a cockroach really badly. <laughs> I agree, cockroach is bad. Yeah, I mean it's a good picture. There's this really cool book um, called "Insect Dreams: The Half Life of Gregor Samsa." So in it, the charwoman, instead of sweeping Gregor out of the room at the end, covered with dust and with the apple stuck in his back, she takes him to a circus and sells him to the circus. And he becomes an act in the circus, and then he leaves and goes to America, and he becomes an advisor to Franklin Roosevelt, and then goes and helps develop the atomic bomb. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good book. Um, well, I can't think of any other questions to ask you, but I would love to keep talking to you, but I know you're busy. And I really appreciate you coming on today. Um, the Scent of Pine is a great book. It's featured right in the front of our bookstore. And um, I hope we can talk again when you finish your next novel. Yes, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed this. It's, uh, it, it really was the most um, fun interview I've ever had with this book. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Thank you so much. It's because I think it might be nice simply because I like your book so much and I can, you know, I'll, I know I'll always remember the name. I think you really know when you like a book when you can remember the names forever. And so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, it's it, it's really nice. I, I'm really grateful. And it's been, and your questions were amazing. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, great. Okay. So we'll talk again soon. That was uh, The Scent of Pine is the book. Laura Vapnyar is the author. And um, just came out beginning of January. I think it was January 7th. And it's a great book. She's really a sweetheart. I love talking to her. And I, I'm fascinated with the idea that she doesn't speak in English. She only writes in English. Um, and uh, she even speaks to her children in Russian. They answer in English. 
So I, I, I think that happens in a lot of situations. My grandmother never learned a word of English except for machine. Whenever we drive over, she'd say, hey, did you come in the machine? But um, anyway, I would strongly re recommend The Scent of Pine and her short stories. And like I said, if you subscribe to The New Yorker and you can go to the archive, just type in uh, Vapnyar because um, that's the only Vapnyar in the archive. And you come up with five or six of her short stories, which are excellent. So anyway, um, next week I thought what we would do is rebroadcast uh, The Flamethrowers, which is a book um, – that uh, was at the top of the New York Times bestselling list, won all kinds of awards. It's now been issued in paperback, so I thought it might be appropriate to to play it again. Um, if we change our mind and find somebody live, I'll move it down a bit. But next week, as far as I'm concerned, um, The Flamethrowers, which is kind of set in the what I would call incendiary 1970s, um, kind of juxtaposes the New York art scene motorcycle racing in Nevada, radical politics in Italy. Um, it's It really, it sounds like they're completely different themes, but she moves them all together, and um, it's all about the life of a, a young uh, girl, woman, artist, and the connections between that um, art and uh, politics. Uh, it, it's really confident. It inhabits the history of the time, um, and the kind of book I like, as you probably know from listening to me talk, is the kind that some authors don't like to hear, magical realism, where it uh, weaves together the uh, invented with the real. It's I like when people create an imaginary world within our real one. Um, so in any event, I really enjoy talking to Laura Vapnyar, and I hope you'll join us again next week on The Avid Reader. You've been listening to the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.